Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to our channel. Today, we're going to be doing a review slash overview of the Nicopole trilogy. Now, here, these are our main characters. Nicopole himself, this god named Horus, he's an Egyptian god, Jill, and the governor, Bulgari. And now, this is called the Nicopole trilogy. It's going to be three stories, uh, a little under 200 pages. The hardcover itself, it's a little bigger than your Marvel oversized hardcovers. Let me just show you next to a regular comic book size book. So yeah, it's quite a big book. It's actually, let's measure it. It's a little under 13 um, inches high, like 12 and a half. And it's 9 and 3 quarters inches wide. So almost 10 inches wide. And the height would be that of your library edition books. This would be the back of the book. It's written and drawn by Enki Bilal. He's a, I believe, a Russian uh, artist. But this book is, uh, I think, French. So, yeah, you know, like, he's a Russian, but he's living and working out of France, right? So that was kind of interesting. Well-traveled uh, guy. All right, so here the... Book end pages, they're like a real dark teal green or maybe like a blue, but real dark. It almost looks black, but it's not. So it's matte paper, pretty uh, thick, the first page. Now after here, you get an introduction. And after these pages are glossy and they're a lot thinner now. These are the pages you're going to get throughout the whole book. Does not ruin the experience for me in any way. I thought they're uh, thick enough. You don't want them too thin, of course. You don't want them like toilet paper. But you don't want them too thick either because then uh, they won't lay flat and so forth. So here you can see, um, you can see the ink to the other side. It does drip through. I don't know if the camera's getting that. But here you can see what the letters on the other side of the page are going to be. Here you get a little bit of what the art is going to look like. Pretty cool. Now the best, first story is uh, a Bedlam and the Immortals. Now it says here, J.F. Pogliari. That's going to be the governor of Paris in, in the year 2023. So this book is crazy because we're already going to be in 2023, right? In a few weeks. And this book uh, was written back in 1980. Well, it was published back in 1980. Meaning it was probably, uh, you know, written maybe a year before, maybe in 79. At least. So here the story starts. Okay, so here we get a picture uh, immediately. You get this big rough paragraph here, kind of letting us know, explain to us where we're at. We're in the year 2023. Now, you got to remember this was published in 1980. So this future is kind of like the writer guessing how he thinks the future is going to be and so forth. Although it was never meant to be completely realistic. It does have like a sci-fi feel to it. So it's the year 2023 and we're in uh, Paris right here. And that's kind of what you, the main gist of what you need to know at that time. Really digging the art. Like, look, let's zoom in right here. Look at all these characters. We're in the slums right here. Kind of like in the ghetto, right? Of, uh, what is it, Parisian? We're in the Parisian country at this point. This is the governor of Bulgaria. Now, here we have this flying uh, Egyptian pyramid. Where all the gods are. Look look at all the gods right here talking to each other. Look at them. Here like in a, they're talking in a table. Talking about the humans and, and whatnot. Uh, they're a bunch of pompous assholes. Just thinking they're like so much better than everybody. Like all oh, these these humans. They don't know what they're doing with earth or with their lives and, and whatnot. Right? And here we have them again. Lot of, kind of dialogue heavy. But it's actually considering the year 1980. The dialogue isn't bad. As far as uh, how much dialogue there is. Because a lot of the comics at that time were real dialogue heavy. This wasn't too bad. And the dialogue is actually pretty good. So so you breeze through it. It doesn't feel like a chore. It doesn't feel like you're doing a lot of reading. Right? The art itself. I really like the art. It has a very... Um, it re I don't know why. It reminded me a lot of, of heavy metal magazines. Not necessarily the covers of the heavy metal magazines. But just a lot of the interior arts. And a lot of those books. It even had a little bit of facial expressions and so forth. Had a little bit of that uh, James Robertson feel. If you've ever read Transmetropolitan, uh, the colors did not remind me of that art, but but sometimes the human uh, faces and so forth did. Okay, now here we have our like kind of like our main villain is uh, Bulgaria. Now he's um 
he's like the governor of Paris and so forth. And here are some of his other people, all, all these politicians here. And I like how they're all paint their faces and so forth to show you it kind of hints at like how it's telling you how politicians are all a bunch of clowns, right? So they have clown makeup, very, very heavy handed with that metaphor. They're letting you know, the writer's letting you know exactly how he feels about these types of people. He doesn't make no bones about it. And I kind of liked it because it, it, it went with the story, right? It was pretty cool. Then here we have the Pope and a bunch of flying angels and so forth. And he's also in a bunch of clown makeup. Now here... We have uh, the governor of Bulgaria walking to meet the Pope and look at all his soldiers. All the soldiers of government, they're supposed to be uh, in, in Paris, I believe. But look at how they're wearing these gray suits, very reminiscent of like the Nazis, right? The Nazi soldiers, they wore these gray uniforms. And he has this other logo here. I believe it's like British or something. It's, it's that cross they wear. But it, it almost... Looks like you could have replaced it with a Nazi a swastika and whatnot. So yeah, it it, uh, it definitely gets a little political here. But that's only like the first story arc. There's three stories. It's a little under 200 pages. So they're about 60 pages each. So it's about 180 pages worth of story here. It's only the first story is like that. The next story is uh, kind of change in tone. Here we get the spaceship landing. And as you can see, look, it doesn't land properly. It crashes into this building. Look at the people here in the ghetto, you know, the almost look homeless and so forth. They're looking at this unfold. A spaceman drops. Bam. He lands, he was frozen, and he breaks his leg here because he's frozen, right? Everybody's looking at him right here. And this is where the story gets going. This is Nikopol. So it turns out he was sent out to space back in 1993. We're now in 2023. He was sent out to space as some type of punishment. He was supposed to do like 20 years there and then they were going to bring him back down to earth. Something happened with the spaceship he was on. He landed 10 years late. So it's two, 2023. He was supposed to be down in 2013, right? So he now finally lands. They're going to thaw him out on freeze him and, and all that good stuff, right? Here we get um, our first introduction to Horace talking to Nicopole. This is the first time they uh, meet each other. I'm just going to call him Nico. So Nico here, his legs are missing or whatever, obviously from what just happened. And Horace is going to make a deal with him. He's a god. He wants to possess his body. Because he wants to take revenge out on the gods. He's like the rebellious god. He wants to go against them. And he's going to go down to earth with the humans, right? And look at the art here. It's crazy. Like, look at this. They have like a freaking shark right here. And look at the train, the metro. It almost looks like a, like teeth right here and like eyeballs. Almost looks like it's possessed, right? Something out of Ghostbusters. So I, I really enjoy the art and the world building. The, the art does a, a great job with all the backgrounds. You kind of just check out how this world looks like and what's going on and so forth. What, what future are we in? So I really enjoyed that. Here we, we go down here. And here he is. He's talking to him. He's giving him this proposition. Let me use you. And he wants to exact revenge, right? Don't want to get too into the story so I don't spoil too much for you guys. But basically, he's going to use him as a, like a pot, if you will. And he just goes around killing people all the time. Nico doesn't really want to be possessed by this god. But at the same time, if he's not, the god goes around killing even more people. So he feels if he works with him, he could somewhat maybe not control him. But um, stop him from killing as much as he does, right? So they're going to work as a team, causing all kinds of freaking mayhem and, and chaos everywhere. And he wants to basically use Nico's body to run for president one day. We fast forward a little bit. We got Nico here already running for president against uh, Bulgaria. So when they're uh, running for president against each other, the god, uh, Nico, as, you, as we zoom down here, you see he does some type of power thing here, some laser thing, and he starts controlling this guy so that he looks bad in the election. He starts running his mouth and saying all these things he's not trying to say because he's controlling them, and he becomes president, right? So he wins the election, and here, zoom into this page, this cat, is, uh, it has some type of power where it knows when someone's not being themselves or whatever, and it starts attacking them because... 
he sees it as not that person. It's someone else possessing them, right? So we know something's wrong here. And now that Nico's president, I thought it was kind of like a, uh, almost like an allegory for how presidents, they're like puppets themselves, right? They're, they're, they don't make their own decisions. They don't speak for themselves. Everything is written for them. It's, it's other people at the table controlling them and telling them what to say and what not to say, right? Now it's up to them to follow those orders or not, right? Which they usually do. And I thought it had some of that because Nico's not president, but he's really being controlled by the God, right? So it's never his own actions and words most of the time are, are it's the Egyptian God's Horuses. Now here you see, this is the, the God Horus. He's flying through the window one day to go back. He's coming back to uh, Nico's apartment to possess his body again, right? Because he sometimes leaves and lets him be himself and, and whatnot. But this time when he shows up, all the Egyptian gods are here. So bam, they, he's been uh, kind of like bamboozled, right? They're like, there, we found out that you were possessing this guy's body that, that became the new president. Uh, we could tell by his ideology and so forth. We knew that's Horus, that's not this guy, right? So he has to be punished because you're not allowed to go possess a human's body and intermingle with, with, with their politics or their lives, right? So things got kind of crazy. And the guy he was running against, the guy he, he took the throne from, basically the presidency from, uh, Bulgaria, He's trying to do, make deals with the gods as well because they need fuel for something. And uh, he has plenty of it because he goes to war with other countries and takes their fuel and whatnot. He wants to offer it to them, but in return, he wants immortality. And they're letting him know it doesn't work that way. We can't grant immortality to humans. It's uh, blasphemous, right? So uh, they're kind of at, at a political stance, the gods, with, with him as well. So a, a lot of moving pieces going on in this story. For uh, just a 60-issue graphic novel or whatever, it has a lot going on uh, for just 60 pages. Punish this guy. They got to punish him because he can't be doing this. So once they punish him, he leaves Nico's body, but it has become kind of dependent of this God being inside him and controlling him the majority of the time, right? So he can't go for long periods without this God uh, running the show. And here towards the end, you see him see he starts getting nosebleeds and so forth. And let me go to the last page here. He's, he's in this asylum. See, he's starting to go kind of crazy. Look at him right here. Look at him right here walking through the walls. So this was the end of the first uh, story. It went uh, 66 pages. It was really about 60 because the rest because there were some introductions and so forth. But yeah, it ends right here. And the, this story was very cohesive and very like political and stuff. The next stories are not as much political and not as cohesive and... It makes sense though, it's done on purpose. One thing I didn't like is here, it doesn't show the cover to the next graphic novel. I really wish it, it did, but it is what it is. It just shows you some sketches and so forth in between every every time a new story arc ends. Here you see the coloring as the next story arc starts. It's called The Woman Trap. It doesn't show the cover though. The art, um, the pencils look the same, but the colors and like inks look kind of different. You see the, the artist has evolved. Now this next story arc is in 1986 so it took six years before we got a continuation because it looked like it was just gonna end right there where he lost his mind right so we got a second one 1986 not sure when the third one was uh written or published but here we get introduced to this new character named jill now she's very pale got some blue hair and this story is basically more about her she's a journalist down on her luck kind of um kind of like just Living kind of a gritty life, right? And it's going to be her story. And she starts like not liking a lot of things about her life. She's kind of like, a, like she's against the government. She's writing things because in other countries, it's not like here in America where the media and so forth can write whatever they want about the government and the president. You know, we got free speech here. We're a very pri privileged in that way. Now, in other countries, uh, they could be killed or something if they speak up on uh, about a president, right? So she writes a lot of things that she shouldn't be writing and that gets in trouble with the government and so forth. And she kind of puts her own life at risk. Her friends that also write and so forth. Here, journalists' lives are at risk um, when they do this kind of stuff. So she's in some dangerous situations and so forth because of that. Because she wants to just kind of uh, let the public know what the government's up to and how they shouldn't be trusted. So this one, it takes a different angle, right? Like uh, we're... Telling the story through this journalist, it almost wants to be a pulpy, uh, 
kind of detective noir type of story, but with a journalist. It, it almost wants to take that route set in a sci-fi setting. Now here you see her, she's uh, one of her journalist uh, friends right here, just got killed. And uh, they do a lot of narrating in this way with this like typewriter types writing. And she starts taking these pills to forget stuff, forget her past, forget certain events and so forth. So in doing so, you're forgetting a lot of your own life. And here forward, you got a lot of broken characters, her, Nico, because he's going crazy now because the God is no longer controlling him. So the God was basically his brain or his mind. So he has lost his mind because they took it from him, right? So the story itself, as you're reading it, you feel like things aren't making sense and, and the story's all over the place. And you feel like you're losing your mind. So you're along for this ride with them, right? So at the end, I was like, man, a lot of things are not making sense. I'm not getting it and, and, and whatnot. And as the story goes, it starts explaining to you uh, that's how you should feel because the story isn't making sense because they're all losing their freaking minds. So I thought that was real clever the way this was written. I really enjoyed it. Uh, there's another story arc. I don't want to ruin any more of the story for you. I want you guys to check it out. Give it a read. Uh, maybe I'll do a separate video where I actually just read the whole story back page by page. In case uh, anybody's interested in that in the future. But on this particular book, I, I just wanted to be a review. I don't want to ruin more. But I thought these were points, uh, parts of the story I kind of had to point out. To make my point of how the story was written going forward, it was, I thought it was real intelligent and real creative the way the writer did that. I've seen, um, uh, last time I, I saw something like this was Grant Morrison's Batman, where slowly Batman is losing his mind and we're going along for the ride, losing our mind with him, right? And this uh, took you there. It took me like I was there just not knowing what's happening either. And that's how these characters are feeling and you're feeling like that uh, right along with them, right? So I highly recommend it. Also, I really love the art, love the dialogue, love the story. Although I, I had points where it didn't make a lot of sense. But like I said, it was meant to be that way. And you'll get uh, rewarded once you finish it. You're like, oh, like that's why it was feeling the way it was feeling. So uh, yeah, anyways, um, I think I talked enough about the book. Uh, hopefully you guys give it a read. I highly recommend it if you're... Want something outside the box and so forth? Uh, if you like the video, go ahead and hit that like button. And if you're not already subscribed, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you can see more of these overviews uh, as I introduce you and show you new and different books, right? So uh, other than that, I'd just like to thank you guys for checking out the video. And I'll check you guys out next time.